The video you are about to watch is from an old woodworking magazine that I published during the years of 2003 to approximately 2006. This was a very unique magazine. It was purely video content and it was distributed on DVDs. The magazine ran for approximately three and a half years and then uh, due to financial concerns we simply had to terminate the magazine. We moved on to other things over the last roughly 15 years. However, there has been a request to resurrect this content, so I've gone through the trouble to get the equipment, the products, everything I needed in order to bring this content back to life to share with everyone. Here on this YouTube channel, we'll be putting up approximately 100 to 120 of the original stories that appeared in that magazine. The magazine was called Woodworking at Home Magazine, and it was truly one of a kind in the world. I really hope you enjoy these videos, and please tell your friends about them. As you can see, this issue's project is fairly large. In fact, it's so involved, we decided to split it up over two different issues of the magazine. There's a lot of steps involved and a lot of parts that have to come together, all with great accuracy. So take your time and work through the project. Now before construction, I'd like to point out a couple of features. Now as you can see on the inside here, the inside of the door and the outside of the door are of the same material. Rather than using a plywood, we use solid quarter inch cherry. And that way the field panels are attractive on both sides. Same is true of the field panels on the sides of the cabinet. In this area we've got a clothes rod where you can hang your clothes. And then we've got seven drawers featuring through dovetail construction. And they slide on very simple runners. Near the front on the center rails and on the sides on the center rails, we've got this diamond applique pattern. Now this really gives the, the piece of furniture its own unique identity. But it may not fit with your likes and dislikes. So if you don't want those and you want the rest of the project, you don't have to install these appliques, nor do you have to install these triangular pieces on the rails. And you can have a little bit more clean looking armoire. So all around the project is very involved. There's a lot of steps and a lot of pieces. But as usual, we'll walk you through each step. Now when starting on a project of this size, you do want to take a little bit more time and plan it out carefully. And that will just make the whole construction process go much more efficiently. Now, like you, I work from the same drawings, I print them out, and then I just put them in a three-ring binder. And that keeps them all together for me, and I'm not finding missing pieces laying around in the shop. The next step, I go through and study each of the components of the project, and then I create a cut list. Then I go through, select my material, rip, cross-cut, plane, joint each of the pieces that I need for all of the components of the project. And that's where we'll be starting on this project at that stage of the game. That looks good. I just completed laying out all the locations for each of the mortises. Now we've got mortises on each of the four legs, the two back rails, and then the styles for the doors. With all the layout complete, we can move over to the hollow chisel mortiser and cut out those mortises. Now I would like to point out that on these rails, the two back rails, be careful on your layout because on the drawing we show it to the shoulder and not to the end of the board or at the end of the tenon. So watch for that. Also be careful on your layout for the legs. Check to make sure everything is in the proper orientation. Over here at the hollow chisel mortiser, I've installed my quarter inch mortising bit and set my fence so that I'm a quarter inch away from the mortising bit and of course I squared up that mortising bit so it's running parallel to the fence and that way your slots are nice and smooth. Now when doing some of the boards, like in the case of the legs where it's laying flat, it may not be thick enough for the hold down clamp to hold the leg down against the table. In cases like that, use a shim underneath. In this case I'm using a three quarter inch shim and that works out real well. Now it's just a matter of drilling each of the mortises. And the hollow chisel mortiser does a nice job of making a nice square mortise. 
For each of those mortises we just machined, we will need to machine a tenon on the mating component, and most of those components are considered rails. Now for all the framework pieces, the tenons are three quarters of an inch long, and for the door, they're one inch long. So we will have to make a fence adjustment during this procedure. Now what I'll do is go through and take this shoulder cut on each of my frame pieces first, leaving the fence at that three quarter inch setting. Then I'll make all of the shoulder cuts going all the way around the board. Then I'll adjust the fence over to an inch and then take the shoulder cuts on the tenons for the door panels. And that way we end up with a more clean cut all the way around if we're not moving that fence back and forth. Now most of our shoulder cuts need to be a quarter inch deep into the face of the material. So I've raised my standard saw blade up to a quarter of an inch. Then I'll be using my miter gauge to feed the part over the saw blade, but I want to be able to have a, a stop so that each of my cuts are very consistent. Now I need to use a stop lock with the fence when we're cutting with the miter gauge because if I don't use this stop lock, which is positioned closer towards me and away from the saw blade, if I don't use that and just bump the board against the fence, as I'm feeding through like this, there's a good chance that I could cock the workpiece and that would cause a bind between the fence and the saw blade and that would cause kickback. So you have to make sure you use a stop lock and position it nearer to you of the blade. Now the second shoulder cut that we need to make will be along the edges of the board and those establish the width of the tenon. Now most of them are a quarter of an inch up but some of them like the top rails are a half inch down from the top edge. Now to make that cut it's exactly the same setup and in the case of our some of the cuts the saw blades are already at a quarter of an inch so all I have to do is pass the board over this way. Now once I get them all cut at that quarter inch setting I'll take each of the rails back into this setup again with the saw blade at a different height and then pass the other edge over the saw blade. And I'll repeat this whole setup and process on the rails for the doors as well. Over here at the bandsaw, we can trim up our tenon to its proper width. Now I'm using a clamp-on tool guide for my fence. Of course, if you've got a fence, use that. And uh, it's just a matter of making the adjustments necessary and then taking each of those cuts. The last step to make our tenon complete is to make the cheek cuts. Now to do that, I'm going to be using my shop-made tenoning jig. Now we showed you how to make this a few issues ago. Of course, there are commercial jigs you can purchase as well. Now the way this will work, we're going to load the workpiece in on edge, the, the jig rides on the fence, and we've set the saw blade so that I'm taking away a quarter inch of material on the outside edge of that cheek. Just pass it over, loosen it up, turn the part around, pass it over a second time, and check it for fit. And I'd say that fits up real good. Just a few more to go, and then we can move on to the next step. As you can see, I've gone through, fit up all my mortise and tenon joints, and got together everything into a dry assembly. Now our next step is to make these triangles that will be fastening to the center rails for the sides and then the two door frames. To start on the triangles, I've already ripped my board to 3 and 15 16 inches wide. Then over here at the compound miter saw, I've swung it over to 31 and a half degrees, and I'll start off by first trimming off one end. Then what I'll do is flip the board over and very carefully line up my saw blade so that I just clean up that corner again. As this is frame and panel construction, we're going to need to machine grooves to accept the field panels for both door frames, the side frames, and the back. We'll work on that now. To machine those grooves, I'm going to be using a quarter inch router bit in my router table. I've got my fence set at a quarter inch away from the bit and the bit raised up at a quarter inch and that will accommodate most of the grooves that we need to machine. Now all we really need to do is pass each of the boards over our router bit. Now on the rails, we'll actually be cutting all the way through from the beginning to the end of the rail. 
on some of the door frame pieces like the styles as well as the legs we're actually going to be making a stop groove where we'll start it inside one of the mortises feed through stop at the other mortise and then remove the piece While we're set up for doing the grooving, we'll get the triangles at this time. What I'm doing now is getting our router bits set up so that I can make this rabbit cut that will create the tongue on the end of our triangle pieces. I want the router bit up a quarter inch and sticking out from the fence a quarter of an inch. And by bringing that router bit up into our auxiliary fence here, I've got a fairly tight clearance there so that the piece can't dive in while we're making the cut. After taking a moment to lay out the center line of the triangle and the rail, we can go ahead and install our little triangle pieces at this time. A little bit of glue and some clamps to hold it in place while the glue sets up. Now we need to start making the dados and grooves on the rest of the frame components. Along the back center style, we need a three-quarter inch wide groove that's an eighth inch deep. To machine that, I'll be using my three-quarter inch stack dado head cutter, which I've raised to an eighth of an inch and set my rip fence to its proper position. On the back side of the front and back top and bottom rails, we need a one-eighth inch deep by three-quarter inch wide dado to be machined in that area. Now, to help with accuracy on this operation, because we do want them all to line up appropriately, I'm using a stop block to help position each of the four pieces as I take these cuts. To machine that rabbit, I'm going to be using a three-quarter inch router bit in my router table. I've got it raised up at the appropriate height and the appropriate amount sticking out from the fence. I then mark the leading and trailing edges of the router bit so that I can make the stop cut when we get down toward the end of the rabbit. And a little bit of handwork to remove that rounded corner. One of our last machining steps here on the legs is to cut away that tapered area that defines the foot of the leg. What I'm doing is laying out the curve that will be at the bottom of the two side rails, the bottom front rail, and then the top front rail. To do that layout, I'm using what I call a bow. It's a thin strip of wood with a string attached at both ends. And by drawing tension on the string, we can change the curvature of that bow. Now, it does require you to have three control points on your workpiece. Two of our control points are these outside corners. At the center of the rail, and a distance coming up from either the top edge down or the bottom edge up, we need to make another mark, and that's our third control point. We adjust tension on that bow until our curve lines up with those three points. Pencil in the line, and then we can go with the bandsaw and cut away that waste material. And now we can clean up the curve a little bit with a drum sander mounted in our drill press. As you can see here, I've got my two door frames clamped together. I've got everything squared up and I've done a little bit of layout work. I've drawn a line or a mark from the bottom up to the top of the door at the center point and did the same thing at the outer edges. Now what I want to do is create that curve layout at the top of the doors. And that curve is essentially the same curve that we have on our top rail. Now, because this rail is a little bit shorter than the doors are wide, we have to compensate a little bit. So I've actually moved my two clamps up that I'm using as a rest here, moved them up about a sixteenth of an inch. Then that way, right here in my middle point, the top of the curve lines up with the height of the door. Now, our top rails are two and a half inches wide. So what I'll do is I'll bring everything down two and a half inches, and then repeat that layout mark, and then we can cut it out at the bandsaw.
then I can go ahead and clean up the inside curve on the drum sander. The outside edge I'll leave rough for now until after assembly. And now we can finally cut the groove in our curved top rails using a handheld router with a rabbiting bit. Now this rabbiting bit is a quarter inch wide and it's got the appropriate diameter bearing on it so that I get a quarter inch wide by a quarter inch deep groove. Now of course because this bit is going to be inside the material I have to make sure I feed in all the way across and then off the piece. I don't want to try and lift the router during this operation. And with everything clamped together again, now you can see how that curved rail looks. Now as mentioned, we're going to need to make these field panels out of solid material. So what I'm going to be doing is resawing some material and then gluing up like any other glue up panel. Now what I do want to do when I'm resawing my material is pay attention to the order of the boards and how they're cut. Now what I want is the grain to be continuous from top to bottom. And on all positions where we need these field panels, there will be an upper and a lower panel. So by having that grain continuous from top to bottom, it just is more appealing to the eye. Furthermore, whenever possible, I want to book match my pieces that make up the panel. And that, of course, also makes it much more appealing when you see that mirror image of two boards. To resaw the material, I'll be using the bandsaw. Now I've installed a resawing blade and my resawing fence, which is nothing more than a, a couple of pieces of wood bolted or nailed together. The vertical piece is parallel to the blade and it's rounded at the front edge. Then there's a base to it that allows me to clamp it to the table. Then I'll set the distance from the blade to the edge of the resaw fence so that I'm cutting along my layout line. Now this particular board is a little bit more than three quarters of an inch thick and I want to get my quarter inch pieces out of it. So I'm just going to resaw right down the center of it. Now to help with that operation, I've put a layout line on the edge of the board. And that's what I want to do is, as I'm feeding the board through on this bandsaw, I want to follow that layout line. And that's why a resaw fence is used. It provides us with that pivot point to help steer the board as we're cutting it. And it also holds the, the board parallel to the saw blade. Then after the resawing operation, we pass it through the thickness planer to clean up the face. Now I'm ready to start gluing up the panels. And for a more detailed explanation, be sure to check out our segment, A Closer Look. And we'll be talking in depth about this process. But for right now, I'll just say that we're going to glue up these pieces. You do want to keep them in the order that you labeled them so that we've got that book matching and the green pattern nice. And you don't need a lot of glue on these thin pieces. Just a small bead right down the center of the edge, and that's all it takes. We don't want to crush the panel, and we certainly don't want to bend it or warp it by putting too much clamp pressure on. All the natural wood field panels need to be cut up to size at this time. So I'll start out by ripping them to width, cross-cutting them, and then using the bandsaw to cut out the details at the top and bottom for the door field panels. Next step is to lay out and cut out these details for the bottom area where it meets up with this triangular piece and at the top area where it's curved and meets up with the curved top rail. And I'll have to do the same process on the side panels. Laying out the curve at the top of the door's field panel, all I had to do is measure up on both edges to the dimension shown on the drawing and then I used my top rail as a template to draw in the curve. The door panels and the side field panels are all natural wood products. Now we know that natural wood products will swell and shrink with changes in temperature and humidity. Now if you're going to be applying a stain to your project, now is the time to stain these field panels. Because if we don't stain them now, come winter when this panel shrinks up during the dry season, you'll see where the stain didn't match up or didn't cover in the areas that were hidden up in those grooves. 
Now I will be applying a stain and I'll be explaining the finish later on in the project. But for right now, I will be applying stain to both sides of my field panels. I'm also going to sand them up smooth as well as all the inside edges of each of the styles and rails because now I can get at them. Once it's assembled, I can't get at those areas. And now we can go ahead and start assembling the two door frames. I'm just using yellow woodworking glue in each of the mortise joints. We'll bring all the pieces together and clamp it up good and tight. Because of the unusual shape of our middle rail, we do need to get the field panels on before we can put the top and bottom rails in place. And we want to make sure that we don't get glue anywhere in that groove where the panel sits. The panel must float because it is natural wood. And we'll let that sit in the clamps for about an hour or two and then we can move on. Our doors are a partial overlay door. So we're going to need a 3 8 by 3 8 inch rabbit along the top edge, bottom edge, and along the outside edges. And of course this rabbit's on the back side. To mill that rabbit, I'm using a rabbiting bit in my handheld router. And because this is a fairly large rabbit, I don't want to take it all in one pass. I'll take it in three passes with about an eighth inch on each pass. I sincerely hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you truly enjoyed it, please help us share this information with the rest of the communities. Please hit the subscribe button, give us a big thumbs up, and be sure to tell your friends about this channel. Thanks again for watching.